On Rachel de Jong's face, there is no trace of fear, only a radiant smile. The girl in a swimsuit with wet hair stands with four friends on the rocks amidst a small pond. Behind them, a clear sky and green forest. This is one of those photographs that captured the joy of a summer day, a perfect moment to cherish from their weekend trip outside the city. For Rachel's father, Kevin, it's difficult to look at this picture. They were having fun, and they simply didn't realize the looming danger until it was too late. Just a few minutes after Rachel took her final selfie, the 21-year-old girl tragically lost her life while trying to save her friend. On the morning of Monday, February 6, 2017, a group of friends began packing their belongings to head back home to Auckland, the largest city in New Zealand. The previous evening, they had spent their time at Lake Tikitapu, also known as the Blue Lake, where a big concert called Flushella took place. During the event, the audience listened to music while floating on inflatable boats and mattresses. There were seven friends in total, Rachel, Gemma, and sisters Alice and Michaela came to the concert from Auckland. They all stayed at Rachel's friend Maddie's place in the picturesque countryside outside of Taupo. Sam and Reese, who were police officers and friends of Maddie's older sister, also spent the night at her house. After the concert, the young people had a very calm evening, had a few drinks, and then went to their respective rooms to rest shortly after midnight. In the morning, they all got up quite early to leave before the traffic jams that inevitably formed on the roads. February 6th is a significant national holiday in New Zealand, it's Waitangi Day, which commemorates the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi, considered the founding document of the country. Thus, traffic jams on the roads were quite common on this day. Once their belongings were packed, and the young people were ready to hit the road, one of them, 21-year-old Rachel de Jong, suggested deviating from the planned route before heading back home. She had heard from Maddie about a charming spot on the river, located just 15 minutes away from them and conveniently along the way to Auckland. This hidden gem was a relatively deep pool of water with unbelievably clear water, nestled right in the middle of the forest. The pool was part of the Waikato River, although the Waikato River itself was either very shallow or completely dry. As a result, this pool looked like a small oasis in the forest, filled with pristine blue water. There were no proper roads leading to it, but the locals had long established a trail from the main road to this enchanting spot. As Rachel's suggestion was met with agreement, they all thought it was an excellent plan. They split into three cars and around 11.40, they followed Rachel and Maddie, who were leading the way. Carefully parking their cars on the roadside, they followed the girls into the forest along a trail that started right by the main road. After about 15 minutes at 11.55, they realized they were getting very close to the river as the trees weren't as dense. However, at precisely 11.55, the friends suddenly came to a halt because an ear-piercing siren sound emerged from somewhere within the woods just ahead of them. The sound lasted for about 20 to 30 seconds and ceased as abruptly as it had begun. Puzzled, the boys and girls exchanged glances, unsure of what to make of it. Failing to come up with an explanation for the siren, they simply brushed it off and continued on their way. Just a minute later, they reached the end of the trail and found themselves on the edge of a not-too-high cliff that overlooked the water, which was their destination. Ropes were hanging down to help people descend to the water. The young people eagerly changed into their swimsuits and, despite the heat of Taupo, where the thermometer had risen to 33 degrees Celsius, they clambered down the rocks and held onto tree roots to get to the water. Once in the water, they enjoyed the refreshing swim in the central part of the water body, where two large boulders formed a miniature island. Five of the girls climbed on these rocks to admire the view, take photos, and relish this unplanned diversion on their way home. At 11.58, the same loud and persistent siren sound echoed throughout the entire forest once more. It was the same sound they heard just three minutes earlier while walking on the trail. Again, all seven of them looked at each other, trying to comprehend its meaning when, after about 20 seconds, the siren went silent. There were no signs of danger around them, 
nothing was happening, and they were surrounded by picturesque scenery, so they relaxed once more. Rachel was recording videos and photos with her GoPro, while the others took selfies. However, just two minutes later, precisely at 12 o'clock, the sound echoed once again. By this time, the friends had heard it twice, and although it was alarming as it sounded so loud and intrusive, since nothing followed after it, the young people quickly brushed it off. The siren ceased, just like before. But this time, something entirely different began to happen, and all seven friends, sensed it simultaneously. As soon as the siren subsided, a new sound emerged. It was coming from the same direction, upstream. Even though the river was dry, one could turn around, look up the flow's direction, and clearly see where the riverbed would be if it were full of water. The young people continued to stand on the mini island in the center of the water, listening to the loud, destructive sound of unknown origin. They exchanged curious glances, trying to comprehend what it could be when suddenly they saw it. A white wall of foaming water was rushing toward them at an enormous speed. By the time they realized it was a water wall descending downstream, it had already reached the water body, and the water level began to rise rapidly before their eyes. The water body where the young people decided to swim was not dangerous in itself. However, it became perilous due to its location in the area known as the water release, spill, and flush. Approximately 200 meters upstream from the water body was the Aratiatia Dam. Three to four times a day, the dam gates were opened, releasing an enormous amount of water at a speed of 76,000 liters per second down the usually dry riverbed. Aratiatia Dam differed from most others in that typically hydroelectric stations are built close to the dam, just downstream, at the lower point of the river rapids. If this were the case for Aratiatia, all the rapids would be consistently submerged. However, to protect the environment, the hydroelectric station was built about 400 meters downstream from the dam. Water flowed from the dam to the station through a 10 meter wide riverbed channel. Opening the gates for the water release created an illusion that the dam didn't exist at all. The gates remained open for about 15 minutes, and one reason for the water release was to please tourists' eyes. It showed spectators what the river looked like before the dam was built, a raging torrent. Of course, the release of such a massive volume of water was hazardous. As per instructions from the authorities, the siren was supposed to sound three times, to warn people about the impending water release, five minutes before, two minutes before, and right before the dam gates opened. However, in case of unforeseen circumstances, such as the need to release water due to an unusually high water level, the siren wouldn't be activated. On February 6, 2017, the scheduled water release was planned for noon. Therefore, the sirens at 11.55, 11.58, and at 12 o'clock warned of the imminent opening of the dam gates. However, the friends had no knowledge of this because two weeks before Maddie, Rachel, Reese, Alice, and the others decided to swim at this secret spot in the forest, the warning sign about the Waikato River's danger was stolen. It was the exact sign that stood at the beginning of the trail through the forest. When the friends got out of their cars and walked towards the water body, they were unaware of the danger they were heading towards. Although Rachel and Maddie had learned about this spot several months ago, they were evidently only aware of its existence and how to get there. They had not walked down the trail themselves. Even though the Department of Conservation DOC, knew the sign had disappeared, it had not been replaced. As the rocks on which the young people stood began to be submerged, they realized that this couldn't go on for much longer. Whatever this torrent was, it was soon going to engulf them and they needed to find safety. However, the fast-flowing water made it impossible for them to swim back to Sam on the shore. Their only option was to try to reach Reese, who was closer to them on the other side of the rocks. By this point, the raging water had reached the girls' knees, making it difficult for them to stand, let alone swim. They decided to take a chance and jump, attempting to grasp Reese's outstretched hands. Rachel took the risk first. She grabbed a selfie stick, extended it in front of her, 
and jumped as close to Reese as possible. He managed to grab the stick and pulled Rachel to safety behind him. Next was Maddie. She jumped, and Reese tried to catch her, but she slipped out of his grip. Moreover, he lost his balance and the current began to sweep him away too. Reese recalls that the water instantly separated them, and they were swept underwater. It felt like being in a washing machine, I had no control, I was running out of air, and honestly, I thought that was it. Michaela remembers how she was dragged underwater, hitting the rocks, and slowly losing her breath. I was under the water for so long, I was exhausted. But then I saw light and just swam up. While the two struggled for their lives, being carried away by the water, Rachel and Maddie managed to keep their composure. Rachel stood in Reese place and once again reached for her selfie stick. She extended it and offered it to Gemma. Gemma jumped, and with her friend's help, she was pulled to safety. Only Alice remained. Rachel yelled for Alice to jump and grab the stick. Alice, who was nearly submerged, jumped and managed to grasp the stick but let go, and the current began to carry her away. At that moment, Rachel, who was in a safe position, leapt into the water after her friend. She grabbed Alice and tried to hold onto a protrusion but couldn't manage. The current carried both of them away. Gemma, Maddie, and Sam, who were still on the safe side, helplessly watched as their friends were swept away downstream. Tourists who had gathered on the bridge over the river, expecting to witness the popular water release, were horrified as they saw the water engulf the rock where Rachel and her friends had been standing, and several people being carried away by the raging torrent. Some even captured the terrifying scene on video. When the water flow finally ceased, the three friends who weren't swept away contacted the rescue service, and immediately rushed to search for the others. They found them. Three miraculously survived, but one did not. The victim was 21-year-old Rachel De Jong, the very girl who was already safe but chose to jump into the raging water to save her friend. Rachel De Jong knew how to enjoy life. Talented, athletic, and intelligent, she was one of the top students at Long Bay College, popular among her peers. She loved spending time outdoors, especially near water. Her parents raised her to think for herself, and not be afraid to try new things. However, she always assessed the risks for herself and others. Her father, Kevin De Jong, said that he and his wife worked hard to provide the best start in life for their daughter and her two younger brothers. But nothing was handed to her on a silver platter. She chose to dedicate herself to the challenging work of rehabilitating patients with spinal injuries. She was talented, but she also worked hard, and selfless. She always valued others more than herself. That's why she is where she is now, Kevin said. Kevin saw photos and even videos of Rachel's final moments, taken by tourists. Each girl jumped into the water, one by one, until only the last one remained. With outstretched arms, she jumped into the water. Rachel grabbed her hand, slipped, turned to grab a rock, and disappeared from view. These photos and videos will never be made public. Kevin doesn't want his daughter's last moments to always be accessible or for survivors to constantly encounter reminders of that day on the internet. Kevin admits that it's very difficult for him to look at these images. They weren't silly girls taking selfies, Kevin says, disregarding the obvious danger coming their way. They thought they were safe on those rocks, they had no idea of the danger they were in until it was too late. They weren't stupid people. If intelligent people can fall into such a trap, there's a chance it might happen again. And that needs to be prevented. The grief of losing his daughter is compounded by the bitterness of hurtful comments blaming Rachel for what happened. Some people callously claim that there were signs and sirens, so there's no need to change anything and spoil the enjoyment of swimming in the waterhole just because Rachel and her friends ignored the warnings. Kevin of course, disagrees with this. He believes that no one should be blamed for Rachel's death but wants someone to take action to prevent another incident. Changes have been made, the stolen signs, the ones Rachel might have seen, were replaced, and a large steel barrier now blocks the unofficial path. 
Ropes that visitors used to descend to the river have been cut. However, Kevin believes it's not enough and necessary to install cameras or use drones to monitor the river before releasing the deadly flow. Because the floods continue, and people keep slipping to the beautiful water hole hidden amidst the forest. Because the beautiful water hole amidst the forest continues to entice local residents and tourists who gather there, disregarding signs and barriers.